Welcome to all of you for this first Sunday of October. Um, today is World Communion Sunday. So what is that? That's a chance for lots and lots of different Christians around the world to know that we're all celebrating communion on the same day. And to realize, you know, that the church is not just our little community here at Eel River, but it's a much broader and bigger thing. So we do have communion today at the end of the service. Um, as far as other announcements, a few that I have, and then it'll be a chance. For, if you have any announcements, you can come to the mic and share those. So we're saying goodbye today to our five friends over here to my left. They've been with us for the past month, and um, they're going to be moving on to Fort Wayne, to the Beacon Heights Church for a while. Um, we have a board meeting on Tuesday, and it's the one where we plan for next year's budget and for the fall council meeting, so it's an important one. Um, we do have council meeting coming in two weeks, so that's after the morning service on October 16th. And I know that uh, Debbie has said she would like to step down as church clerk. I'm hoping I can step down as board chair. So, <laughs> so there might be, and we'll have as many, uh, be electing as many as seven people to church board because normally we elect five, but we were one short last year. And Sally just agreed to serve a one-year term, so that means seven. So what I'm saying is church council meeting in two weeks is probably going to be kind of important. So if you can make plans to be there, that'd be great. Um, are there other announcements? Um, fellowship meal is coming up. It's going to be a fun one, special one. And we're going to have posters next week about it. It's October 19. I think I have that date right. A Wednesday night fellowship meal here. Um, so come and enjoy one another. Sorry, it's a little cool in here this morning, but next week I'll have the heat on for us. Andy shared that our friends are leaving, but I, and I don't know if you've all had a chance to meet them, but I wanted to at least introduce them so you know their names. <laughs> um, Raul, here in the baseball cap, and then Gerald, he's hard to see. You can see his, his hat, but he's, on, he's there, but... Gerald's hard to see. And then uh, Jimmy is kind of keeping track of Gerald. And then Curly is over here with the, the bucket drums. And then uh, the baby Maria there in the red and her mom, Dorothy. So just so you have names if you run into them on the streets or wherever. They, they kind of hang out in churches. Yeah. Yeah. You might say homeless. I mean, they're not homeless because they're here, but you know. Maybe you could write care of Dave Thornburg in Indianapolis.
I just want to thank everyone for all their help yesterday for the fall party. It turned out great, and um, we all had a good time, I think. Um, anyone that did do tie-dye, um, I did take Sarah and Paisley's tie-dyes um, apart last night, and they turned out really great. And so if you want to see a picture of them, I do have them on my phone. I sent them to Sally, so there's a picture of their tie-dye shirts. So you can actually take them down if you want to today, and um, you can wash them then, and they should be able, you can wear them then. So it was a lot of fun. So I hope everyone else had fun. And thanks to Patty, too, for all the work she does. I have two announcements. One is that... The Chimes group is going to start practicing not tomorrow, but the following Monday. It'll be Monday evenings at 6.30 p.m. And if you haven't already talked to me about wanting to be a part of that group, we would welcome anyone that would like to play. So let me know. And then also, a few of you have asked me about the Sing Me Home Fall Festival that's happening at Manchester Church of the Brethren next Saturday. And I am going to be a part of that. It goes from 4 to 10. And it is planned to be outdoors on the Manchester Church of the Brethren land. I've heard they're going to be serving hot beverages. But if it does get way too cold, they're going to move it inside of the Manchester Church. From 4 to 6, there's going to be workshops. Uh, there's going to be an uh, instrument-making workshop, I think, run for both hours of that, and then there's a singing workshop at four, and then I'm leading a writing workshop at five, from five to six, on poetic storytelling. And then there's gonna be uh, food trucks and different local vendors and artists that are gonna have their work there. And then some singers and bands from seven to 10, uh, singing on spirituality, social justice, making meaning out of the mystery of life, things like that. And if you want the names, there is a website for the Sing Me Home Festival, or I put a poster out there, or you can ask me. Um, but I'm going to be giving, in between the bands and the singers, different um, theopoetic reflections or poetry readings or things like that. So that's going to be my role next Saturday uh, at that. But yeah, let me know if you have any other questions. Yeah, I was going to do that when it came to be offering time. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. On the back, yeah. Is there garden work tomorrow, Cliff? The harvest is pretty well done? Okay. So... Some optional garden work tomorrow, mostly sort of cleaning things up, yeah. Uh, I'm not using this for my call to worship, but just bring to your attention that on the back of the bulletin, there is a thing about uh, World Communion Sunday. But for call to worship, I'm going to use Psalm 27, verse 1. It goes like this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let's pray. God, we come to worship from a world where there is much fear. We each have our own worries, and the weight of the world can be heavy. Your strength is what we need. Help us to be of one mind this morning, your light filling us with the joy of your salvation. Amen. Our first hymn is My Life Flows On, number 580. Please stand. I 
One thing I forgot to mention in announcements is that uh, Debbie has uh, already collected and printed the agenda for the council meeting in two weeks and some of the reports. So you can pick that up. You can look at that ahead of time. And then you can be prepared for what happens in two weeks. This is the time in our service when we get to share with one another our concerns and joys, talk about what's going on in our lives that we would like to share with this community. And we'll start with the time for concerns. So please feel free to step up to the mic and share any concerns you would like to with the church family. This week, remind us that your spirit is all around us every hour of every day, above us, below us, and within us. Amen. For offering, um, just a little 
clarification for those of you who are newer to our church and maybe don't know how we do things. We have a regular offering, and that goes in the offering plate on your right. Each month, we have a particular cause that we give special offerings for. Uh, this month, it's Camp Mac, and that's going to go in the middle one. And as Carolyn was reminding me at the beginning, next week for our special offering, instead of Camp Mac, we're going to have a special offering for Ruth Ruiz. And there's an item in the current ripples that uh, Cliff wrote about her family. And the, the short story is that her dad died in Texas. She had to fly down there to make all the funeral arrangements. It ended up uh, with about $7,000 of credit card debt that she's trying to pay off. And the church uh, has contributed $1,000 towards that, but the special offering next week would be people's chance to um, contribute beyond that. And then once a month, first Sunday of the month, we have what we call the five cents a meal offering. So that's going to go in the big African bowl on your left. And the idea there is that every time you have a meal, you put in five cents per person into a jar, and then uh, we collect that money, and it goes uh, for the cause of fighting global hunger. So uh, this is the time when we can make our love visible through the giving of our tithes and offerings, and let's give with cheerful hearts. Generous God, over and over, your grace sustains us. Over and over, your love provides for us. Over and over, your arm steadies us. We give you these gifts with gratitude and joy, thankful that you are God over all. Amen. Our next hymn is number 551. We're going to be singing verses 1, 4, and 5. It's going to be kind of new to us. Janine played it during the prelude this morning, and she's going to play it through here once for us now. Um, if you want to, well, why don't you stay seated and kind of focus on listening and watching the words and seeing if we can hit one, four, and five then.
Arlene has children's time. God is love. Um, yeah, we can do it. Andy's Andy's one of our I need another volunteer besides Johnny. Okay. So this is probably for all of us adults anyway. So <laughs> So this morning um I'm wondering if you all know what a mystery is. It's a mystery to you. Yeah, that's what I thought maybe you would say. Well, a mystery is something you you kind of you kind of think is right and real but it's just not clear and you're not sure but it might be. So, I'm going to give you we'll get into the mystery a bit later. Andy has two silver dollars. Cliff has two pennies. And Johnny's going to be our helper. Do you want some too? I'll give you, I'll give you some. So this morning, um, Audrey's going to talk about the widow who put in two cents. And um, what I want us to think about is why that's a mystery, what Jesus said. So I'm going to, Johnny's going to help us here, handing us this, the offering plate. It's already kind of full, but we're going to see about putting more. And I'm going to be first. I'm going to put all this in. All of that I put in. Now Andy's going to put some in. Yeah. Now Cliff's going to put. Thank you, Johnny. And Johnny's going to put his in. Now Jesus talked about who put the most in. And now I think I did because I put a lot of money in there. I put it all in, and Andy put what he had, Johnny put, but Cliff put two pennies. And Jesus said that the woman who put two pennies put in the most. Now, I've got a lot of money in my pocket here, but I put in the most. I had the most, I put in the most. But Cliff put in two pennies, and Jesus said that was the most. Now, for most of us, that for Andy, that doesn't work with math and all. That does not work if you have the most and you put in two. That's not much. But in Jesus' mystery part, that's the mystery. She put in the most. Cliff put in the most when he put in two pennies because he put in everything he had. These two guys still have more in their pocket, and I got a lot in my pocket. And I, but I put in some, but not all. So that's Jesus' word for us about mystery and what we need to do the most and the not most. Thank you. So this, our scripture is the story that Arlene just told us about, and it's from Mark 12, and uh, verses 41 to 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, 
all she had to live on. At the district conference held last weekend, they took up an offering during the worship service. When I opened my wallet to see if I had any cash, I found only two pennies. I won't say I didn't think about it, that I didn't think about the widow who gave all she had to give, which was just two coins. I did think about that coincidence, which is why I chose that scripture for this morning. I thought about how even those two coins given an offering could still be used for a greater purpose. And I wanted to take them out to give them, but then I thought about how it would look to the people sitting at the table around me. We were just supposed to put our offerings in a basket in the center of the table where everybody could see what we gave if they wanted to look. It wasn't a whole handful of change. It wasn't even quarters. It was just two pennies. I was worried that they would think, what's the point? Two cents? Why even bother? So I closed my wallet and I put it back in my purse. I did end up giving my two pennies in the offering plate here at Eel River last Sunday. Whoever counted the offering might have wondered about that odd change. But the more I thought about it, the more I felt like those pennies were supposed to be given in offering. And I'll give you my two cents today as well. There was a study done this year on how the COVID-19 pandemic affected church offerings. And the study found that despite all the financial uncertainty, giving at churches either stayed steady or increased during the height of the pandemic. 84% of givers reported that they maintained or increased their giving to their places of worship in 2021. And 77% of faith leaders reported giving to their congregations increased or remained the same in 2021. During those troubling times, in answer to our prayers, that was much the case for our church congregation as well. Although we weren't in church for several weeks, our offerings did not disappear or drastically decrease. There might be a few reasons why. Maybe one is that for some it is even easier to give when there isn't a crowd watching you. Nobody with reason to judge how much you give in times of economic uncertainty. So it feels okay to give just what you have. And so maybe that's what people did. And like the women at the temple, it was enough. Maybe it's because of how service-oriented the people in this congregation are always prepared to help anyone in need. And during the pandemic, when nobody could come to church, it seemed more than ever the church was in need. So maybe people gave more to help, and it was enough. But we've been back now in the building, and it seems like maybe thing, things are okay, and mostly back to the way they were. So is there really that same need to give now as there was before? Maybe we've settled back into a routine of giving what seems prudent to give each week, whatever is left over from the other things we spent our money on, or just the same designated amount every Sunday. I know on Stewardship Sundays so often the goal is to get a pledge of X amount regularly to support the church, and I'm not saying that's not an important system, but when giving is about offering what you have out of gratitude, then genuine, honest giving is so much more than just a set designated amount every week. It's not giving because we should, it's giving because we are amazed by the church or so moved that we feel called to give. Now, I probably don't have to tell many of you the reasons for giving to the ministry of this church. I probably don't have to tell you that I have felt since I started here as a pastor three and a half years ago, such an outpouring of support and understanding and love from the members of this congregation that has amazed me. I have been called into the ministry many times by many people 
But I truly feel that God knew that this congregation was the place for me to accept that calling. I knew from the first love feast that I attended here, only weeks after I started, where Roger and Doug had given me just a small part in the anointing to ease me in. They were such gracious mentors. And I walked into that fellowship hall downstairs and I saw it just filled with people, which in a larger church is more expected. But I just remember thinking, wow, almost everyone in the congregation must be here. That's something special. It told me that the ministries of this congregation are for people who value participating in the life of the church. I probably don't have to tell you that without this congregation, I may have never followed my calling to go to Bethany Seminary and get my master's in theopoetics, which has led to so many wonderful opportunities like speaking at National Young Adult Conference and National Youth Conference and now an annual conference this summer at the Sing Me Home Festival this weekend and even being a writing professor, which was a dream of mine. Beyond my own story, I have lost count of the number of people who in their stories of the first time they visited Eel River have used the phrase, I had never felt so welcome. And it's not any one thing they can put their finger on most of the time. It's just a feeling of being noticed, perhaps, but not singled out. Or of belonging, even while still a stranger. Or of being treated like family, who are there for one another no matter what happens. Maybe you know what it is. It's not anything big or flashy. It's more humble and down to earth. It's holding in the same space a creation care announcement on a Sunday morning about donating all guns to be recycled into plows and standing with respect at Frank Beaver's graveside service during the folding of the flag in honor of the sacrifice that he made to serve when he was called into war. Knowing how preciously Frank held the hope for peace in his heart but also that all his experiences were a part of what made him who he was. It's the knowledge that we have not all voted the same or paid taxes in the same bracket or agree on the latest news debate, but that there's a man from Galilee, a carpenter, Jesus Christ, who set an example that we all try to follow and that's to love our neighbors. And to love each other, we have to gather together and worship together and get to know one another as a community. And that we are. And it is not always easy. But it is a ministry of this church. It's this small community with the Sunday school class and the women's group and the chime choir and the three care groups and the monthly fellowship meals and the summer church retreat and the ice cream social and the fall party and the hosting child disaster training. It's a small community that is a living church that welcomes strangers, not as visitors, but as part of the family. It's the calling of the priesthood of believers that runs through this congregation the willingness to try new ministries for the first time, to extend compassion and grace when things don't go as planned, and rejoice when they do. The music, the worship, the people who have stood and shared from pulpits, who volunteer their time for church board, and to go to conference, and to teach children's church, and to sit in the nursery, offering gifts and talents and time. That's how this congregation can stay healthy. There's an energy and a happiness to be here, not out of obligation, but because this church means something. There was a presentation at district conference about churches who can't afford to pay pastors full time and how to set appropriate expectations so that the pastor isn't expected to work full time on a less than full time salary. Filling pastoral roles with deacons, volunteers, guest preachers. And I wanted to stand up and say, my congregation is already doing that. 
and they are an incredible example. I was having coffee with Annalisa, our district executive minister, on Friday, and I was telling her how grateful I was that when I told you that I got the teaching position at University of St. Francis, you all clapped. And she said, that's the future of the church, recognizing and supporting everyone's calls to ministry and the many ways in which we are called. I can be here in the pulpit on Sunday and sitting among people yesterday at the fall party and standing in front of 24 18-year-olds on Monday and out in the woods helping with my mother's class of three-year-olds on Tuesday. And those are all ministries in their own way, opportunities to show love and to extend compassion and to make others feel welcome and to show faith by example. And you all realize that and recognize all the ministries here among us now. And maybe I've gotten off topic because the topic was tithing and the reason to give abundantly, not because we feel pressured to or because we've promised a certain amount, but because we are amazed by the ministries of the church. But there's my two cents. This Sunday is World Communion Sunday, and as Christians, when we think of giving all we have to give, we certainly recall the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus gave, giving up his life on the cross. Communion is a ritual of the church that all are welcome to share in together. It is symbolic of the scene before Jesus' death where he shares in a last supper with his disciples, gathers together with those closest to him, kneels to wash their feet, breaks bread with them, and raises a glass with them. Even the one he knew would soon betray him. A final example for them all of how to show fellowship, even among those who might be seen as enemies. A final example for them of how to remember him and what he worked for in the world. The bread broken and the cup shared are in remembrance of Jesus' ministry, of his call to Christian community, service to others, repentance of wrongdoing, forgiveness of sins, and above all, love. So when we make the decision to participate in communion, we are choosing to let go of the things that are weighing us down or holding us back. Our negativity, jealousy, bitterness, hatred toward others or toward ourselves, greed or angry grudges. When we take the bread and the cup, it is a reminder to us to live in a spirit of compassion towards others and towards ourselves, offering grace and forgiveness, seeking to understand rather than to judge, finding gratitude in daily life and showing love to everyone we meet. Communion is a ministry for making things right between ourselves and God, of seeking peace with ourselves and pledging to treat others as Jesus would. In remembrance of Jesus' ministry, we will take communion together this morning. I want to welcome the deacons up to the front and just note that since today is World Communion Sunday, there are many across this world who are taking communion as well. And those include people who have been through terrible disasters, who are suffering in war-torn places, who are worshiping with very heavy hearts. And this morning, we take communion alongside them. In just a moment, you may come forward as you feel ready. Exiting from the outside of the pews by the wall so that you can take first the bread and then the cup and then return to your aisles through the middle. If you're unable to come forward for any reason but you still wish to take part in communion, Raise your hand and the bread and cup can be brought to you. Let us join in communion together.
please join in our closing hymn number 477, For the Bread. Please stand on this one. Janine will play through it for us once. Go now in peace, spreading Christ's love in the world to everyone you meet and hold in your prayers our brothers and sisters of the world this week.